Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Carl Miller. I'm the research director of a new centre at Demos uh, called the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media. Um, we're interested in applying uh, social media research to policy relevant decisions. Uh, and this is a project which we actually did uh, as on the sideline, uh, myself and uh, a range of different colleagues across the different disciplines from the social science and political sciences uh, all the way through to uh, the computer and kind of quantitative sciences to try and uh, test uh, the power uh, of uh, social media research to generate the kind of evidence which you need um, to change minds uh, in kind of uh, political and policy decision making communities. Um, it was born out of a kind of scepticism with a lot of what we regard to be social media analytics so far. Uh, the problem we saw to be that them the, to be just serving up a series of raw metrics uh, which we thought didn't give you the kind of sociological and humanistic power to really explain human behaviour and therefore really make a convincing case for why the research was powerful enough to change minds. So this was, this was, this was a, a kind of a, a proof of concept we did on uh, the nation's uh, favourite uh, phone-in talent show, X Factor. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to very briefly in the next four minutes um, talk through two of the outputs of that research. The first is the worm. Uh, this was a way of capturing um, the immediate sentiment uh, of uh, everyone on Twitter that was um, talking about uh, uh, the different contestants on X Factor. Um, here you can see the logical architecture. Um, first you collect all the tweets, then we applied a series of natural language uh, programming or processing techniques to classify them in sentiment. These were, these were bespoke sentiment classifiers which we created exactly for this, so they were quite accurate in that they were trained to recognise positive and negative sentiment specifically for these candidates and specifically within the context of X-Factor conversations. Um, we then discarded the neutral tweets because they were, they were analytically irrelevant to us uh, and then we, we um, through a series of classification and visualisation, created what we called the worm, which was um, a, a running, um, to see at the bottom here, a, 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 a running uh, visualisation of various, um, of, of each contestant, um, 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 fed through uh, all, all the millions of people uh, that were talking about them on Twitter. And you could see when you actually look at the behaviour um, of uh, Twitter during X Factor, that th each of these um, spikes is uh, a, uh, is, 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 is linked to when a contestant was uh, actually on air. So people would talk about each contestant um, as, they were, um, as, as they were singing. So from this we thought actually Twitter's a pretty good way of us being able to analyse the specific uh, audience reaction uh, to each contestant's um, performance on X Factor. And so we created this. This was uh, the worm and I just wanted to show it to you in action. So you can see uh, the, the line on the uh, right, which is yellow, uh, is Janet Devlin. Uh, for those of you that uh, didn't watch X Factor, uh, Janet Devlin is the uh, person that's singing now. Um, the thickness of the line uh, denotes the volume of Twitter conversations we currently have. So you can see that uh, you can see that Janet Devlin is uh, Johnny Robinson was the last person to sing. You can see that he's gradually reducing in volume, and people are beginning to talk about Janet Devlin now. Um, the reason why I've chosen this as a case study will become quite clear in a second. So I won't inflict too many more seconds of uh, X Factor content on you. So you can see that people are quite liking this so far. And any minute now. That was key. Janet just forgot the words to the song. Um, and you can see that the reaction on Twitter uh, was almost immediate. Twitter is now, if you imagine, exploding. This visualization is capturing an explosion of negative reactions on Twitter, uh, noticing uh, Janet, Devlin's, um, Janet Devlin's botched performance. Anyway, I think, we've, um, I think we've got the idea there. Um, so that really captured uh, in real time or near real time um, a way in which we're using social media to try and understand um, how people reacted to um, people's performance on television. Um, and you could see through there that, that 
the immediate re and, and quite intuitive reaction to Janet Devlin forgetting the words was a negative one. And incidentally, Janet got voted off uh, at the end of that week. Um, I'm just going to skip through that side. And that uh, actually um, relates to the second um, um, a kind of effort which we tried, which was to actually predict the outcome of the X Factor voting each week based on, this, based on social media content. Um, here, we, we essentially constructed through the first couple of weeks a kind of a, 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 a two-variable a two variable model. First of all, we, we, and this relying on a, a series of kind of um, cephalotical literature, we, we noticed that two things basically happen on X Factor. You first have a body of hardcore fans that are going to vote for each of their candidates every week without fail. And people actually created uh, Twitter uh, entities called, you know, We Love Janet Devlin, um, who were then you know, flood, flood Twitter with uh, pro, pro Janet uh, propaganda. Um, but also, actually, quite a lot of people vote on the basis of actually the performance. So it was trying to capture these two kind of sociological phenomena happening at the same time uh, and try and translate that into a, basically an analytical model which isn't just, it's trying to move beyond just trying to describe what's happening on social media and instead is actually, and in a predictive way, really giving you information about what's happening offline in the real world. Um, um, we used, so we, we, we built these two things up, and you can see that the, the sentiment uh, there we, we built on, mainly on Twitter, uh, po positive over total, positive over positive and negative, uh, and YouTube likes per view, uh, and the, the sediment we built, we, we built up, and this is a kind of the longer standing thing which carried on from, uh, from one week to another. Uh, we, built a, a, on, um, we built on a Twitter community of positive comments uh, and Facebook likes. Uh, we fed them in. Uh, we then needed to work out how uh, sentiment, sediment and sentiment related to one another. So we uh, conducted in the first three or four weeks a series of recursive best fit analyses to try and describe the, the quantitative relationship or try and quantify the relationship to, between each of these different essentially proxies of, of kind of sentiment which we're, we're, we're measuring uh, and, and these two kind of multi-proxy kind of variables which, um, which, which our model was based on. This was, I'm not sure if this was the, the, the final series of weightings, but this was one of the la later week uh, weightings. And you can see here that um, sediment um, in the later weeks, and this kept changing, incidentally, these, these quantitative relationships. Sediment counted for very little. Most people seem to be, um, most people seem to be reacting to the specific week's performances. Uh, and on sediment specifically, Twitter didn't seem to matter too much, actually. Facebook was much more important. Um, some people on Facebook, actually Janet Devlin in particular, uh, had built an exponentially larger uh, Facebook following um, than, um, than some, some, some of her rivals. Uh, and sentiment uh, there, Twitter actually was, um, was not the most powerful um, predictor again. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the number of people going and liking the YouTube videos which were posted up um, uh, after each week's performance. So how did we do? Well, um, we, we had a website which we, um, we published each week our, uh, our uh, kind of floating um, hierarchy and a, and a drop zone at the end, uh, a, a kind of a, a, our predictions about how the vote was going to go. And these were our predictions uh, overall. And you can see the, the, the green, obviously, is uh, where we got it right and the red is where we got it wrong. We actually did pretty well. Um, we were finding um, that this was re really a, a way in which you can really use um, um, social media research to make concrete offline uh, descriptions. So there we go. Um, I think that the, the value in the project, and this was, please let me undermine, you know, uh, underline, uh, really, really a kind of a, 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 a in principle first stab at trying to make complete, c concrete kind of insight into the way people behave from social media. Um, the real value was in trying to move from those series of raw metrics, so just the, the, that kind of descriptive way of approaching um, social media research into actually giving you genuine insight and therefore trying to derive causality, meaning, and prediction uh, uh, from it. Uh, and we look forward at the centre of uh, the analysis of social media at Demos to do much more of this kind of work in the future. Thanks very much. How many, <clears throat> how many words did she actually forget? Uh, about four or five. Yeah, that's what it looked like. There were almost none. That's almost I didn't none. Know the song. So if you had you not said she forgot those words, I wouldn't have noticed that. Right. Um, so those had to be people who knew the song quite well. I mean, they knew all the words. Right. Um, and, uh, but that was an amazing, suddenly, it's just like her support drops off a cliff. I know, it's really striking, isn't it? That's really why we, that's why I use that case study in particular. It doesn't, it's not just a dip. It's no, no, it really, it, and, and actually, um, the, other, the, the other really strong case study we have uh, is a group called Little Mix. And I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you remember Little Mix. Little Mix went on to win X Factor. 
And for most of the competition, Little Mix was a kind of mid-table side. It was, it was fairly inoffensive. It didn't have a huge amount of traffic about it, actually. It was just kind of sailing through each week. And then it had one breakthrough performance where they sang Alien. And if you look at that performance as well, they begin where you expect them to, actually, in kind of like the lower mid-table. And it just, it just shoots up con consistently and stays high uh, throughout that performance. And that gives you such a strong performance, uh, such a strong sense about how um, kind of influential that performance was, how, how, how that, a uniformly positive reaction or, or, or an aggregate, a really strong positive reaction. Um, and, they, and they stayed at the top of the table. They stayed at the top of our table as well uh, and then went on, to, went on to win the competition. So that was that 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 was one of the big challenges uh, in NLP generally is the use of kind of figurative and non-literal language. Um, I can't. I, I don't. I don't have a statistical uh, number to give you. Uh, I know that this was something which, um, in training the uh, NLP classifier, in training the sentiment classifiers, uh, our colleagues at the text analytics group at the University of Sussex, who who, who constructed those classifiers, were very much looking at that at that particular problem. We were running diagnostics each week. Um, to uh, measure the accuracy of the sentiment and anal analytical engine we were using uh, and continually actually retraining it. There's a process called um, supervised machine learning wherein you basically annotate a series of tweets for the computer and then the algorithm kind of extrapolates what it infers to be the important content from those tweets onwards and then starts making decisions itself. But actually that's really based, it's so specifically based on the, on the, on the context of the conversation. So, yeah, and as the conversation changes, um, it continues to evolve. Um, Misha was one of our, M M Misha B, Misha Bryan, was one of, was one of the ones we missed. Uh, and we, we, did a, we did a small kind of, um, uh, kind of retrospective into kind of why we got that one wrong. Um, there was loads of coverage in the press that week that Misha was a bully. Um, there's a series of kind of rolling stories about X Factor contestants kind of um, in, between the, in between the TV programs. And there was a story that she was kind of bullying a couple of other contestants, uh, and she got quite a lot of negative press as a result. The reason we missed this is because up until that point, the word bully and all the kind of cognate words and all the similar kind of words for bully um, hadn't pop cropped up in X Factor related conversations whatsoever. So it was it, our sentiment analytical programs hadn't really picked up. Um, hadn't really picked up all, all that kind of brewing negative sentiment, which was there on Twitter. We then subsequently retrained the classifier with the data from that week, with an analyst saying, an analyst marking as clearly negative tweets condemning Misha for a bully, and we would have got it right that week as well. Um, but you're right, non-literal language, huge, huge problem for um, the, the success of, uh, of uh, sentiment analysis. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Thanks, Carl.